Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited today to be joined by Maura Hughes, who is the CEO of Boston MedFlight. Maura, thank you so much for uh, being part of the discussion. My pleasure, Eric. Maybe you could just give us a little bit of background for those that uh, aren't aware about you know, who, who and what is Boston MedFlight. Sure. So uh, Boston MedFlight is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to care for the most critically ill and injured patients in our region. And we do that responding to scenes of accidents uh, with our helicopters. But the vast, vast majority of what we do is uh, taking patients from community hospitals um, into the academic medical centers um, in our region um, for um, advanced care. Awesome. Awesome. So I would, I would imagine, you know, you guys have been probably pretty impacted by COVID-19. You know, how, how has Boston MedFlight, given that you're in the healthcare space, been involved with a lot of what's going on with COVID-19? Or, you know, how has that impacted the organization? Well, I'll tell you, Eric, um, Boston MedFlight staff have been phenomenal through this whole um, pandemic. And, you know, our crews take care of infectious disease patients, you know, regularly but nothing on this scale. And so back, it was late February, early March, um, our clinical crew and our operational crews got together and basically said, okay, how, how are we gonna ramp this up quickly? It was you know, making sure everybody was trained on PPE, clinical protocols, uh, making sure we had all the supplies and equipment that the staff would need. And we were really geared up very, very quickly for this. And we actually were completely ready uh, before we saw our first, first uh, COVID patient. But I'll tell you, um, this was a phenomenal um, undertaking. At this today, um, we have cared for over 570 critically ill COVID patients, wow. and wow. these patients are critically ill. They um, you are intubated, so they have uh, breathing tubes in, they're uh, mechanically ventilated, very ill uh, patients, and um, there are very few uh, services in our region that can actually care for these patients, and um, the crews have just done a phenomenal, phenomenal job, and through all of this, we've had no staff test positive uh, for the virus, which is just I mean, absolutely, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal. Wow. That's great. That's great. How's it, how's it impacted the organizations, the operations, or, you know, uh, just, you know, in the internal workings of the organization? Well, a lot of, lot has changed. Obviously, it's a, it's a big financial hit, even though we're really busy transporting, cr transporting critically ill COVID patients. 92% uh, of those patients have been in our ground units. So our ground um, units are basically mobile ICUs on the ground. Um, but the reimbursement uh, for those transports, you know, is just not there. And our helicopter volume, uh, which really drive our finances, you know, we're, we've been under budget by like 50%. Uh, which really impacts finances and the inability to do fundraising. Uh, we've canceled all of our in-person fundraisers uh, between now and the end of the year. So that's going to be impactful to us. Um, obviously the lower uh, patient volume. Um, but some other things that we've changed operationally is uh, we've done remote work. So we have been remote with our non-operational staff for the last three months. And that's worked really, really well. We basically said, um, back at the beginning of March, we've got to figure out how to do remote work if we need to do it. And then we flicked the switch. Everyone was home with some type of mobile device. So um, everything is remote now, you know, finance, accounting, uh, development, uh, patient financial services, IT, and that's worked really, really well. Um, I, I shut up to think what would have happened three years ago because we wouldn't have been able to um, do this with the IT infrastructure that we have, but we've asked a lot for our IT staff um, and we, we signed up for a Zoom account about four weeks ago um, and we use a lot of Zoom and a lot of video conferencing um, to just try to stay in touch with staff. Yeah, it's hard keeping a relationship in a ro remote working environment. The, vi the video does help a lot, but... Um... Yeah, I started doing um, weekly uh, town halls, uh, so I would um, just let staff know what was going on. I thought it was very important, especially in periods of crisis, for to, you know to over communicate. Um, so we have town halls um, every week. We were having Zoom, um, you know, staff meetings, and just trying to keep everyone connected is definitely a challenge when you don't physically in the same uh, space with somebody. Yeah, have those worked out well so far? 
it's worked out really well. And as a matter of fact, in our staff meetings, we've actually had much more better attendance and engagement um, because you know folks able to dial in uh, remote. And I think this is something that we're going to probably continue going over. I'm always looking for, you know, where's my lemonade out of my lemons? And I think there's a lot of things that we've learned and a lot of great things that we can do, you know, going forward to change. So, so when you look at like moving forward, you know, what, what are some of the big things that you need to look at? You know, I mean, there's the short term, there's the long term. Um, you know, what, what are some of the immediate concerns or the immediate things that you need to be looking at? And what are some of the long range strategies that you need to be conceptualizing, you know, now or, or start kind of, you know, planting seeds on? I think in the short term, uh, we really need to do a lot of modeling and what we're going to look like in the future. Uh, this remote work, I believe, is going to be something that's, you know, here to stay. And, you know, how do we best look at that? Um, do we have the right processes? Do we have the right positions? You know, look at those pieces. Uh, I also know that we're going to be taking care of these critically ill COVID patients for a long time. And how do we support the staff? How do we look at um, you know, what they have from a training perspective, you know, supplies, et cetera. One of our big challenges uh, through all of this was our supply chain. And looking back on it, you know, you always, you placed an order for N95 masks and they show up, but now you place an order and it's supposed to be on your door and no, you, your, your order's You have to track them down from the shipping container coming into, you know, California to getting yeah. in here. Yeah. And, and, and you can't count on it unless it's, you know, sitting on your doorstep. Amazing. And, you know, we have fabulous relationships, you know, with our suppliers. Um, but, you know, this was an unprecedented event. So that's one of the things we're really going to be looking at over, you know, now and into the future is supply chain and what happens when we can't rely on our, you know, usual relationships and our expectations, you know, particularly when it comes to, you know, PPE and, um, you know, the, the, uh, the pieces that we really need to take care of these critically ill COVID patients. Wow, that, that, that's a lot. How about, like, how about long term, you know, when you look at the supply chain or you look at, you know, your staffing models and things like that, you know, how about over the next three to five years, because, you know, things are dramatically evolving. Are you seeing any, you know, any, any uh, you know, major shifts in, in kind of focus over the long run? You know, what does that look like? I think that uh, we've learned a lot over the last, you know, few months. And obviously, we're known a lot for what we do um, for critical care transport. And we actually ha have posted all of our protocols of how to take care of these COVID patients. And we've shared them uh, with our industry colleagues. So I think that's going to continue. Uh, we have a phenomenal um, education department, and we've always been limited of how many people we can fit in the room and, you know, how many, you know, people can, you know, make their way out to our Bedford headquarters. But I can see doing a lot now, um, you know, virtually. We have a uh, critical care conference every uh, fall, and it's always so, sold out. 250 uh, folks come in, fabulous speakers. We're going to do that virtually this year, breaking up in, you know, to, into sections. And I think that's going to be great because you can scale uh, much more easily you know, with, with doing electronically as opposed to having you know, the physical space. Yeah, we, we work a lot with uh, trade associations, you know, your 501c6 nonprofits. And one of their main services is education to the market. You know, and we're always trying to tell them that, and, and maybe this didn't resonate as much before COVID, but you know, post-COVID, uh, it certainly is, is that the, the, the concept of geographical boundaries are just gone. Mm -hmm. and, and now that everyone's working remote, it's an expected, sort, uh, uh, an expected method of delivery. Mm -hmm. So really your, ed your education um, you know, has the opportunity to go you know, pretty, pretty wide as a, uh, you know, as, as a leader in the field. And I think you just have to rely on the technology. I mean, everyone says, oh, I can't wait for things to get back to normal, but that's not, that's not what's going to happen. You need to be looking into the future. We actually just um, had some new folks start here last Monday. We had never met them in person. We actually interviewed them all um, you know, electronically, and we just met them in person on their first day of work. But that's, that's what the future is. And um, you know, we, we're, we keep you know, moving along and looking for ways you know, to, to improve what we're doing. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's amazing to see how many opportunities it affords you if you just pay attention, right? Um, so I imagine you've got a lot of uh, leadership lessons through this. You know, what are, what are, 
you know, in the past few months, what are some of the big leadership lessons that have stood out to you or things that you've learned personally about yourself, um, you know, kind of in crisis management? Um, first of all, I have to say that I think the most important thing being a leader is making sure that the right people are in the right roles. And we've spent a lot of time over the last few years um, developing our middle, middle management team, our senior management team, and giving them the responsibility. There was just so much that needed to be done and everybody, everybody has their roles. And one of the things we decided early on was we're not gonna barrage um, our poor staff with emails from me and HR and safety and operations. There would be one point of contact. So our safety officer was actually the one person sending out um, sometimes daily um, emails to the staff with updates. And I think that you know worked really well um, and I think that the staff really appreciated that. Uh, I think the other thing too is the staff needed to feel like we were supporting them, you know, giving them, giving them the PPE, um, you know, giving them the training, giving them all of the tools that they need, you know, to do their jobs. I mean, these are phenomenally creative, um, you know, folks and they're always, you know, up for a challenge, you know, what we do every day is deal with people in crisis yeah. and this was obviously dealing with people in crisis and it was just phenomenal um so that but then also looking at, at after their not their just their physical well-being but their mental you know well-being because this is tough this is this is tough stuff these transports are taking twice as long as the usual transports and you have to decontaminate the vehicles after the fact and it's um it's it's really difficult work and just supporting the staff, you know, through all that, I think was a big leadership um, challenge. Now you have a peer to peer group that supports the staff, right? With, a, because you, 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 you work in a very um, demanding job, uh, mm -hmm. both physically and mentally. T can you tell, tell us a little bit about the peer group and what, 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 what's manifested there and how that's evolved? Sure. I mean, what, what, our de what our folks do every day is very, very, you know, difficult uh, work. And uh, the organization really wanted to support what they do. We've had an EAP program for, I don't know, 15 years. But the fact of the matter is, if someone has a bad call or someone's having a bad time, they don't want to talk to a non-anonymous person on, on the other end of a phone. They really want to talk to somebody who does the work that they do and understand the work that they do. So our staff actually um, created what's called the Boston Med Flight Wing Team. And it's a, a group of volunteers. Um, they actually get some uh, training of how to deal with people in crisis. And they actually have, um, you know, on call. And, it, and we actually give heads up, um, you know, to someone say, hey, you know what, this person had a really bad call, or this person has something bad going on in their life, you know, you want to reach out to them. So it doesn't abdicate our responsibility, you know, as managers, and we obviously still check in, but sometimes they want to talk to a peer, and it's worked really, really well. And I have to give my hats off to the peer support team, because this is something that they do out of the goodness of their hearts, you know, as volunteers, and it's worked, you know, really, really well for us. That's great. I know a lot of organizations that, you know, the stress level or the anxiety levels have been so high and, you know, just creating that inner, um, you know, that, that opportunity internally to talk to somebody, uh, I, I think it's phenomenal. So I'm glad, mm -hmm. I'm glad that that's going well for you guys. I hope other people consider adopting something like that or finding out more about it because, um, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the stress levels are high in today's world. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, just switching gears real quick, because I, I, I always usually like to end, end the discussions on a high note. What is, what has been one of the bright spots that has materialized in the past few months? Uh, you know, maybe that is a story that resonates with you or just kind of an example of something that's, you know, that was just awesome uh, that happened and worthy, worthy of note, you know, noting. Well, you know, obviously every single successful patient transport, you know, is awesome. Um, and the staff, staff has been awesome. You know, the remote workers, you know, working um, from home and keeping everything running behind the scenes has been awesome. But we really thought early on, we have to do something fun. We need to have some fun things to do. So some of the things that we did uh, was we created um, a Boston MedFlight uh, kind of a coloring book um, out of our vehicles. And so we had a coloring contest, you know, for all the little kiddos who are at home. So we had a Boston MedFlight staff coloring contest. So that was fine, uh, fun. 
And then we did a, a TikTok video challenge, which was also awesome. We have very, some very creative folks. You're going to have to train me on what TikTok is because because my kids talk about it, but I, I don't have a clue. It was fabulous, fabulous. It was very, very creative. And then currently what we're doing right now is Boston Mid-Flight Pets. Uh, so most talented, cutest, whatever. So we really felt like we needed, it's a, it's a lot of work, a lot of hard work, but we obviously wanted to do um, some fun stuff too for the, for the Boston Mid-Flight uh, staff and their families. Makes a great culture. Mm -hmm. Gotta have, gotta, gotta, gotta try to find the bright spot in the fun. You gotta do the fun stuff. You gotta have to make, you have to have a smile. You gotta find joy in what you do, right? That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being part of the discussion today, Mara. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Eric. All right, so for anyone that wants to learn more about uh, Mora, the team at Boston MedFlight, please click the link below. Uh, and if you're also interested in, uh, we, we welcome you to subscribe to the channel so that you can get uh, notifications and hear great uh, discussions and interviews with awesome leaders like Mora. Thanks for watching.